Maybe it's going to work. <coughs> yeah, that song begins. And again, it's on page 12 <coughs> Green Book. It begins, Bright the beams, our Father's mercy from his lighthouse evermore. Of course, uh, a lighthouse to a, a sailor or a seaman is very important. It lets them know how close or far they are from shore, especially <coughs> before we had GPS and, and uh, good maps and all the stuff we have today. They, they were even more important. And so this songwriter is comparing the lighthouse, the light from the lighthouse, to the light of God. And uh, obviously, you know, it's, it's not a, a uh, completely accurate comparison, but it does help us understand the way God's light works. And of course, we all understand that the ultimate source of light is God. You think back to the beginning, back in Genesis chapter 1, on the very first day of creation, God said... Let there be light, and there was light. Now, I can't imagine what the world might be like without light. In fact, really, the world couldn't exist without light. I suppose the planet itself could exist, but there would be no life without light. And so one of the very first things that God brought into existence was light. In uh, John chapter 1, Verses 4 and 5, John is speaking of Jesus, and he says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. <clears throat> now, John begins this chapter, his gospel, in the beginning. In fact, in verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so John brings to our attention, back there to Genesis 1, when God said, let there be light. And now, in a similar situation, God has brought light into the world again. But this time, not in a literal sense, but in a spiritual one. Just like prior to when God created the heavens and the earth, there was no light, and God brought physical light into the world, so before Jesus, the world was in darkness. In a lot of ways, the world's still in darkness. And that's what this song goes on to explain. But before Jesus, it was especially dark. And just like God spoke light into <laughs> Existence at the beginning, he once again sent light into a dark world in the form of his son. So that's where we really begin with this song, God as the source of light. John goes on to say in chapter 8 and verse 12, he says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of of life. <coughs> now this is it's kind of a side note here, but this is one of those seven I am statements that's only found in John. You know, you think back to the burning bush when God spoke to Moses and began to explain to him that he was to go into Egypt and explain to Pharaoh that, that God demanded that Pharaoh let his people go. Moses asked God what his name is. And God said, I am. And in each of these seven cases where Jesus says, I am, that's exactly what he's saying. He's explaining to his followers, to us, that he's God. He says, uh, in other places, I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine, of course, this is a statement like that. He says, I am the light of the world. And so Jesus came into this dark and sinful world to bring light. John says again in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, This thing is the message which we have heard of him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 
Think about where we would be, where I would be, where you would be without Jesus, without his light. How thankful we are that we serve a God who was willing to send his son to bring light into the world while we were in darkness. The song goes on to say, but to us, he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. So again, this is obviously a song. It's a poem. It's a metaphor. Just like he uses the lighthouse to represent God's light, he explains that we also have light. Now, it's not ours in the sense that we originated it or that it comes from us. Again, God is that source of light, but he's entrusted some of that light to us. And it's up to us to keep it. To use it as he has directed us. If you continue reading, we're going to continue reading in 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. John has just said that God is light and in him is no darkness. If we say then, or if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice. <laughs> but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So what's the purpose? Why did God send his light into this dark and sinful world? Well, it's because we needed it. We needed salvation. It was the only way for us to be saved. But notice also, there's a condition. In fact, there's really more than, well, depending on how you look at it, I guess. But there is a big condition. For us to be saved by that light, we have to walk in the light. We have to live a certain way. And so that's that part of us that we have to keep burning, that we have to keep lit. You know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of messages in this song. The first one, really, that I want to notice, hopefully, you know, we all understand that God is the source of light. And he gives us a portion of that light, but it's not permanent, or at least it doesn't have to be, if we don't allow it to be. We can, just like those people we talked about at the beginning in that story, we can let our light go out. And if our light goes out, we can once again be lost, and so we've got to continue walk in the light, to, to keep our light from going out. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 18, the Apostle Paul says these words. He's speaking of God here. He says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now notice, Paul doesn't directly say that God took us out of the kingdom of darkness and translated us or conveyed us put us into the kingdom of light, but that's implied. There's obviously a contrast between the power of darkness and the kingdom of his son, which is the kingdom of Jesus, which is the church. And then, so this is the same sort of thing we're talking about. God has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now notice. We've already talked about how that God brought his light into the world. He sent Jesus into the world to save us. But that's really just part of the picture. Another reason why he sent Jesus into the world, why he brought light into this dark world, is to glorify him. <laughs> so part of what, the reason why we keep our light burning is so, yes, so we're saved. So we can enjoy that fellowship that John talked about in 1 John chapter 1. But also, it's because it glorifies him. 
You see, it ought to be obvious to those around us. And it is obvious to those around us, if we're living like we should, that the light that we shine into the world is not, it doesn't originate with me or with you, but it's God's light. It's the light of Jesus. And so, not only do we engage in glorifying God when we let our light shine, but we also direct others to do the same when they recognize our light. The song goes on to say, Dark the night, this is verse 2 now, Dark the night of sin is settled, Loud the angry billows roar, Eager eyes are watching, Longing for the lights along the shore. <clears throat> now we've already talked about how this world is dark and sin-filled and cursed by sin. But in this verse, he brings in something else. God's light didn't just come into the world for me and for you. It came into the world for all people, everywhere. And it's possible, I would even say probably, that there's somebody in your life that you know that will be lost if not for your light. If not for your allowing the light of Jesus to shine through you. They may not even realize they're looking for it. You know, this song makes it sound like they're eager and they're longing for the light. And they are in a sense, but they may not even realize it. You know, it's obvious if you're on a, I don't know how many of you have ever been on a boat during a storm. I haven't really. I've been, you know, out in the ocean some, but not really a storm. I remember when we lived in Hawaii, we went out uh, parasailing. And there was like nine foot waves that day. So somebody that's not real experienced, it was another relatively small boat. We were getting tossed as we were trying to ride out there to the ocean. Um, but I don't really know what it's like to be in a storm and to be afraid. But that's what this song is talking about. If you're out in a storm on a boat and you're afraid you're going to die, obviously... You're eagerly looking for, the, for some kind of direction to guide you to safety. And that's what we are to be to the world. They may not realize they're lost. They may not even realize they need that light. But it's our job to shine it anyway. Some people aren't going to be interested. In fact, most people aren't going to be interested. But there's somebody there are people in my life that if I fail to let my light shine, they're going to be lost. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, <coughs> verses 14 through 16, ye are the light of the world. And he's talking to his followers. Now, they wouldn't be called Christians yet at this point. This is before his death. But he had followers already. And he says, ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now this is what we've already talked about. So. Why is it so important for us to let our light shine? Now, yes, it's important because without doing so, we will be lost. But also, I am to let my light shine so that when other people see it, how do they see it? Well, Jesus says it's through our good works. You know, Marcus prayed about that in his prayer. How do I let my light shine? Now, a lot of times we think about coming to church. You know, and, and we can let our light shine by coming to church. I don't mean to misrepresent that. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He says we let our light shine by doing good works, by helping others. And when we do that, it's not so people are going to look at me or you and think how good I am. It's so that they glorify God. They should understand that the good that I do does not originate with me. But it's a result of of how God has worked through me. How I have been given the light from God. And it's still God's light. That is put out through 
me. The result of my good works and your good works should be that others, when they see those good works, will glorify God. Paul says in Romans chapter 13, <coughs> verses 12 through 14, he says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Now remember, we read from John, 1 John chapter 1, where John talked about walking in the light. And this is the same thing that Paul's talking about here. The way we walk in the light means that we've got to put away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. He goes on to say in verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. So what do we do? How can we walk in the light? Well, we've got to put away these things. Put away drunkenness. Put away rioting. Live honestly. Not be bickering and fighting amongst ourselves. But, verse 14, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Paul says we've got to wear Christ. We've got to put on Christ. What's he mean there? Obviously, he's not being literal. We can't literally, physically put on Jesus. First of all, he's not even here anymore. What he means, though, is that others, when they see me and when they see you, they shouldn't just see me or you. They should see Jesus. Because we wear Jesus. And so as Jesus said to the people there in the, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, I let my light shine so that others will glorify God. They'll see that light, recognize that it comes from God, and they'll glorify him. That's what Paul's saying. We wear Jesus everywhere we go. It's not a bracelet necessarily or a shirt. Now, I don't know that it's wrong to wear clothes that tell people you're a Christian, but that's not what Paul's talking about. He says that wherever we go, whatever we're involved in, if we're Christians like we should be, we wear Jesus. And so when other people see us, they should, in a sense, see Jesus. And we're leading others to the light that comes from him. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, Paul tells the Galatians, he says, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. <coughs> now, I don't want to leave the impression that all there is to wearing Jesus is being baptized. But Paul explains that when we're baptized, that's when we are clothed that's what we put on in Christ. And then we are to spend the rest of our life wearing Jesus. That means the way I talk, the way I dress, uh, wherever I go, Jesus is with me. And it ought to be obvious to those around me that Jesus is with me. That's how I let my light shine. That's how I make sure that I'm keeping those lower lights burning and leading others to the harbor, to the safety of the church, of the light. In Ephesians 5, Paul puts it this way, beginning in verse 8, we through verse 14. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 8, he says, For you were sometimes darkness. Now this is true of all of us. He is writing here to a church in Ephesus that he established. He lived there for three years in Acts chapter 19. He knows these people well. But he says they used to be in darkness. And that's true of me. It's true of everybody here. If you're a Christian. Some people here might still be in darkness. I don't know. But all of us, at least in the past, were in darkness. And that's what he says to the Ephesians. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. <laughs> you see, it's not just something we talk about. It's, it's something that we do. We're not just children of light because we say we are. If we're children of light, 
It's because we're walking in the light. Verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable in the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. New King James translates that word reprove as expose. And that's what Paul's talking about. How does light interact with darkness? Well, light and darkness can't both exist at the same time. You know, we uh, recently installed some lights in our house. And uh, one, you know, we had this room that just, I don't know why whoever before didn't put very much light in there. And it was dark. But we put in some lights and you flip the switch and now it's light. It can't be light and dark at the same time. And that's how light interacts with darkness. And that's what Paul's saying. If we are children of light, if we're walking in the light, that's going to expose those who are not. Who are walking, walking in darkness. It's going to expose some things that they might need to change. Or that they might need to correct. And that's part of the way we're to function in the world. He goes on to say, uh, verses 12 through 14, this is still Ephesians 5. For it is a shame then to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. We have the responsibility to walk in the light, and let our light shine to others, to lead them. Again, it's not to just expose them. It's not to uh, make others appear bad. It's to show them the right way so that they can change, so that they too can become children of the light. The third verse says, trim your feeble lamp, my brother. Now this phrase gets me thinking about maybe an older Christian. Maybe somebody that's been in the church for a while. And like all of us, they've had hardships, they've had struggles, they've had difficulties. Maybe they begin to get discouraged. And their lamp needs to be trimmed. You know, we don't, this is another phrase that a lot of people, and maybe there's some here in this audience that have some experience with that. I don't. You know, I've, I've never really had to use a lamp with oil and a wick. And, uh, but, you know, from time to time, just like anything else, it requires maintenance. Now, today, when our lights, you know, what happens when our lights go out, we just change the bulb. Or if we got a flashlight, maybe we put new batteries in. But back then, they had to actually trim their lamp and, 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 and do some things to it. Maybe put some more oil in it to make it shine brighter. And that's how it is with us as Christians, too. There's, there's times, well, really, our whole life, but, but especially in times of, of when times are hard, and there's a real struggle. That happens to all of us. We need our, our light needs some maintenance. There's some things that we've got to do to keep our light burning bright. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 25. And I, I could preach a whole sermon on this parable. I'm not going to say a whole lot about it. Mostly I'm just going to read it. But the whole point of this parable is to remind us that things don't always happen the way we think they should. Things don't always happen on our schedule like we might think they should. And we've got to be prepared. We've got to continue. We've got to endure and persevere. Jesus says in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wives took oil of their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight... There was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. 
And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man will come. <clears throat> Notice, all ten of these virgins, or these bridesmaids, as we probably call them today, they all had lamps, they all had lights. I believe all ten of these represent Christians. They're saved. They did all the things that were necessary to be saved. But five of them, the Lord calls foolish because they allowed their lamps to go out. <coughs> now, I don't want to leave you with the wrong impression. Just because your lamp has gone out, maybe you're here this morning and your lamp has gone out, that doesn't mean that. <coughs> Doomed. You can relight it again. The Lord wants to accept you back. But what this parable is about is that these women allowed their lamp to go out, and while it was out, the Lord comes back. And they're lost. This is a dangerous thing. This is how important this is. If we allow our lamps to go out, it might cause us, it will cause us if the Lord comes back and we're in that state to be lost. But while we're still here, while we're still waiting for his return, we don't know when it's going to be. We still have hope. We can change. We can light it again. But if you're here and your light's gone out, you need to light it again. Because we none of us know how much time we have left. The song goes on. Some poor sailor, this is still the, the last part of the third verse. Some poor sailor, tempest tossed, trying now to make the harbor in the darkness may be lost. Now we've talked about already how we're to let our light shine to lead others to Jesus. But for some reason, this part of the song makes me think not of those out in the world that are lost, but it makes me think of my brethren who might be lost, who might have let their light go out. I, I guess it's because of the way that verse started about referring to us to, to trim our lamps and make sure our lights are burning. Well, sometimes <coughs> we need help. Sometimes I need help. Sometimes our brethren need help, but we assist them in getting their light shining bright again. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now all of us, Paul, can, uh, this little section concludes, all of us have to answer for ourselves. All of us are going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul says in another place. And we're going to have to give an account for the things that, that we've done. I'm going to have to give an account for the things that I've done in the body. But, we also might be held accountable for what we didn't do to help others. And Paul says, if we've got a brother or a sister that's gone back into error, or that 
is struggling with some particular problem. It's our job to help them. I think that applies physically. Obviously, we are to uh, help one another when they're in need physically. But more importantly, we're to help one another when we're in need spiritually. And notice, Paul says, we've got to be careful how we do this. You know, Jesus tells a story, a parable, in Matthew chapter 7, about a man who is trying to get a, a little speck out of his brother's eye when he has a beam sticking out of his own eye. Now, obviously, that's, that's kind of a humorous uh, story, but the, the point is the same. The same thing as what Paul's talking to the Galatians about here in Galatians 6. We might have an opportunity to help a brother or a sister come back to the Lord and be saved. But don't forget, the same thing might happen to you. There may be a situation when I, <coughs> and I need to remember that as I seek to assist my brethren. You know, somebody that's made a mistake, somebody that's, that's uh, gone back into some particular sin, is not less of a person than I am. After all, we started out, all of us have been in darkness in the past. Maybe they just need a little help. And I need to remember that sometimes I need help. And so I should be careful. I should be gentle when I, when I help, when I assist my brother. Now, that doesn't mean that I overlook their sin or, 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 or ignore it. Because they, if that's the case, they can't be forgiven of it. Right? In order for me to be forgiven of a sin, I have to first of all acknowledge that I've sinned. And I have to make a decision that I'm not going to do it anymore and I'm going to live for Jesus. But if I never realize that I'm guilty of sin, if I just kind of ignore it and overlook it, I can never be forgiven. And it's the same thing with our brethren. If we don't first of all encourage them to see the error of their ways, then they can't be forgiven. After all, that's the goal. The goal is not just because I want to go to heaven. That's not why I'm a Christian. That's, I, that's a big part of why I'm a Christian. But it's not just that. I want to take others with me. And that ought to be our attitude as Christians. In fact, that's what the song really is about. In fact, the chorus goes like this. Let the lower lights be burning. Send a gleam across the way. Some poor struggling, fainting seamen you may rescue, you may save. Now, I copied this off the internet, and I don't know why they changed the words. Because in that song, in fact, I'm sure it's this way in, in the book. Instead of struggling, fainting, it says... Some poor fainting, struggling seamen. I don't know why that changed it. Maybe they thought it sounded better. But uh, well, I don't guess it really matters. The point's the same. As Christians, we're not just in the business of saving ourselves. Now, that is a big part of who we are. That's why we became a Christian, to be saved. But now, as Christians... Everything we do is about saving others. That's why we let our lights shine. That's why the songwriter wrote the song, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. Now, in conclusion, though, we've mostly been talking about saving others. But you can't save others unless you yourself are saved first. You know, I, um, I don't know how many years been on an airplane. Uh, some have, some probably haven't. But uh, one of the things that, that this made me think about, thinking about saving yourself first, is when you're on an airplane, they always give a, like a safety talk, or like a demonstration at the beginning. And I've seen it so many times, I pretty much just ignore it. But, but one of the things they tell you is that if you have some kind of accident, and those oxygen masks fall out of the ceiling. I've never been on a plane when that happened. But I, you know, I guess that's what happens when the you know, plane loses pressure or something. You put the mask on yourself, then you help the person next to you. Now, especially as parents, um, I can imagine that would be, that's just not your first instinct. Your first instinct would be to save your kids. But the reason why they tell you that is, if, if I am trying to help my kid and I pass out, I can't help them anymore. And so I've got to put my mask on first so that I can help them. That's basically what we're, the way it is with Christianity as well. 
You can't help somebody else be saved unless you're saved yourself. And if you're here in this audience this morning and you're in a lost condition, now yes, we want to save others, but before you can save others, you've got to be saved yourself. Peter says here in Acts chapter 2, verses 40 and 41. Now, um, really this, is, this is Luke writing this, but just prior to this, you know, they stop Peter's sermon in verse 37 and say, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says in verse 38, Repent and be baptized. Well, it continues on here, verses 40 and 41, it says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. If you're here this morning and you're lost, you need to save yourself. Just like Peter told these people. Now, obviously, you can't save yourself in the sense that, that you can do it by yourself. Salvation comes from Jesus and from his sacrifice. But how we respond to that determines whether we're saved or not. Verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The lesson is yours this morning. But if you're here... And for whatever reason, your light's not shining. Maybe you've never obeyed the gospel. Maybe you've never started. You've never lit your lamp to begin with. Well, fix that. Change it right now. You've got to believe in Jesus. Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 24, Except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 11, and verse 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now surely, if you're here in this audience, you believe in Jesus. Well, that belief in Jesus should cause you to want to live for Him. That's what repentance is. It's about changing your life. You change the way you've been living to live like Jesus wants you to. And Jesus says in Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, I tell you today, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And of course, Peter told the people, as we mentioned earlier in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, to repent and be baptized. 